1.5% a year. Um, at the same rate of, at the same level of income, India and Indonesia are going to be required to be rapidly reducing their emissions. Um, so that, I think, is <laughs> an illustration of the problem. So now what I want to do is very quickly give you a thought experiment about how to think about the solution to the problem, which is equity and ambition are two sides of the same coin. A three-phase process um, can structure the negotiations in which we first agree to some principles and some indicators and then work out how to, you know, how to negotiate an agreement around those principles and indicators. And we put equity in the center of the table along with uh, ambition. And the, 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 uh, the thought experiment I'm going to show you is called Greenhouse Development Rights. It's one that I've been working on with a team of other people as part of a team for quite a long time. And I want to emphasize that it is not a proposal. What happens in the climate regime is going to be negotiated between sovereign states. But it's a way of thinking about an extremely ambitious global mobilization after the Kyoto annexes have been given a dignified retirement. Um, it is a reference framework. It allows you to look at a country's pledges relative to a rough but robust calculation of their fair share of the global effort. Um, the key concept is a responsibility and capacity index. Instead of putting countries into annexes, what you can do is take the two fundamental principles of CBDRRC, historical responsibility and capacity to act, and you can quantify them. And then you can, on the basis of that quantification, you can assign each country an index which indicates what fraction of the global effort it would be fair if you accept those principles for it to take on. Capacity, we define as 20, all income, all national income above $20 a day. All income below $20 a day is presumed to be survival income that should not be obligated as part of a global climate effort. And all respo responsibility is taken to be cumulative CO2 emissions since 1990. We're not going very, very far into the past, and we don't have to because we're talking about capacity as well as responsibility. Again, any, in, any emissions associated with consumption below the development threshold, that is to say consumption below $20 a day, are excluded from the calculation of historical responsibility. This is what it looks like. There is the, the, there is the development threshold for India. There is the development threshold for China. There is the development threshold for the United States. That little bit of income above the development threshold in India is what we call India's capacity. As you can see, China has much more capacity, and the United States has a great deal of capacity. Um, it's a dynamic system. Similarly, responsibility. I'm going through this very quickly, but I want to show you Japan compared to India, okay? Uh, something that's been quite salient at this meeting. As you can see, um, the total emissions, total Japanese uh, emissions and total Indian emissions are actually quite similar, but 
very small percentage of India's emissions count as responsibility because the vast majority of them are associated with consumption below the development threshold. That is the, the consumption of extremely poor people. And we believe that should not be counted as historical responsibility. Here's, now here's what I want to show you is that this is a dynamic system, and I want, I want you to, the point here is that if you put aside the annexes, if you have a global deal, it has to be a dynamic deal, it has to be based on equity principles, in this case, historical responsibility and capacity, it has to be constantly recalculated as the composition of the global economy changes. This is the responsibility and capacity index calculated for 2010 for large countries or groups of countries. You can see, for example, that in 2010 we calculate that Japan had 10% of the capacity 5% of the responsibility, and we gave it a, a responsibility and capacity index of 7.6. You can also see that that drops by 2020 and drops again by 2030 as China's responsibility and capacity as a fraction of total global responsibility and capacity drops. Look at China. China, we calculate, had 5.4% of the responsibility and capacity in 2010, which we project will increase to 11.2% of total global responsibility and capacity by 2020, and 16.4% by 2030. Note that the United States drops from 29% to 24 in that percent in that same period. That is to say, we're saying in 2030, the United States will still have 24% of the global responsibility and capacity, but China will have 16. By 2040, they would probably be the same. Um, so thank you very much for that notice. So, um, you know, I, I, I I can go arbitrarily through lots of charts, but I'm not going to because I just want to slow down and repeat my key points, okay? First, this is a true emergency. Two degrees, which is the global consensus target, is dangerous, extremely dangerous. However, it's the global consensus target for a reason, which is that we cannot imagine hitting a target any tighter than two degrees under the current political circumstances. The annexes have a historical purpose, but they haven't worked out as negotiating instruments. After Durban, it's clear that we're going to have to negotiate a spectrum approach in which countries have obligations that are based on transparent and universally understood equity principles. The equity principles which are laid out in the framework convention are common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. This, the problem that we face is that no matter what we do, many, many countries in the world have to bring their emissions to a peak and then enter a very steep decline while they are still quite poor. The question is, how are we going to do that? 